I think we're going live now, so it's still setting up. Okay. It looks like we are going live now. And uh, we can just wait a few minutes here. It's okay. Meet. <laughs> just unmute, unmute. There we go. There we go. All set. <clears throat> we'll just wait for some people to join and then we can start. So I was just, yeah. Are you okay? I'm fine, yeah. Okay, don't worry, Mom. Yeah? Fine. I'm good. You sure? You can yes, wait. Yes. We've got a couple of minutes. <laughs> Yeah, so very exciting, very, very excited. Let's start. Yeah. Um, yeah, you got something to drink? No, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you lift it a little, yeah, there we go. There we go. That's good. That's really good. You can hear me clearly? I can, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. I'll give you a signal if I... Um, if for some reason there's a there's a break in connection or I can't hear you. Okay. So there's a there's a thing where you can raise your hand or I'll just raise my hand. <laughs> yeah, so good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mam Roche. Good afternoon and welcome to Facebook Live. Um, our last series for the month of August in, uh, in our series, Planting Seeds of Hope. It's been an exciting Women's Month. And um, we are very, very, very excited to have Mam Roche here with us this afternoon um, as, we, as we end this month on, a, I think we've saved the best for last. <laughs> so um, welcome Mam Roche on behalf of Succeed, on behalf of um, Richard May Street, Patrick and myself, we are thrilled for you, for you to be with us. Thank you for making the time um, and for uh, you know just, just doing all the prep with us. It's just really, really exciting. And um, let me introduce you, although I, I feel like um, you are somebody who needs very little to know introduction. introduction. Um, but Mam Roche Peters is a counselor for 45 years. She is, if you ask her who she, who she is and what she is, she says, I'm not a motivational speaker. I am the lover of the word. And I must say the word of God is like DNA. <laughs> it's like your DNA. She is the co-pastor with Uncle Mervyn Peters at the Eastgate uh, Church. Um, also the author of six books. Um, and also the woman who discipled me when I first came to the Lord. Um, so, so Mam Roche, you hold a very special place in our lives today, um, and welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, uh, Nishani. It's such a joy to be with you on Facebook Live. Such a joy to connect with you again after so many years. Brings me so much joy to know that God will bring us all together eventually. And yes, it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be with you uh, this afternoon. And we pray that God will have his own way and that his purposes will be established most of all. Yeah, 
that 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 I believe is going to happen this afternoon. I have come. I woke up this morning with an expectant heart, and I know Amen. it's because of this hour. Um, so, Mom Roche, you know, this is a series called Seeds of Hope, and one of the incredible seeds that was planted in your own life was a green Gideon Bible at a very very young age. And uh, tell us a little bit about that and how you came to know God as your father. Well, I'm smiling because I'm just wondering where you got that from. <laughs> yes, it's, <true. laughs> it's a testimony that I've given, uh, especially to the Gideons. Um, Nishani, uh, you know, life was not easy. Uh, we all know that we go through tremendous challenges. Uh, when I was five years old, um, somebody had taken me to, uh, to Sunday school, uh, got permission from my family, from my father, especially to take me to Sunday school. Uh, we were not Christian. And so what I heard there really changed my life. I was so attracted to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, after just one visit to Sunday school. And uh, then I grew up and in primary school, we were given these little Bibles, you know, for free. And you take anything for free and you get excited about it, you know. But anyway, I took this Bible and I had it in my bag and I would carry it day in and day out, not leave it at home, but let it stay in my bag. Never read it, just kept it in my bag. And then finally, when I grew up and I lost my dad, very strategic time in my life. I must have been around 13 years old when my dad passed on. I took it very badly. I struggled with the death. I could not imagine life without my father. And I started to get yeah. mild nervous breakdowns. So I had three mild nervous breakdowns, went on heavy medication for a while. And eventually on the night that I thought I must rather die because I'm not gonna make it. I just cannot deal with this depression, this pain, the loss of a loved one that was so close to my heart. I'm never going to make it. And on the night that I decided I wanted to actually take my life, I decided, let me just talk to Jesus. I don't know him that well. I had heard about him when I was little, but let me just talk to Jesus. So I went on my knees and I thought, this is how Christians pray. So let me copy them and do what they do. And then I also pulled out this little Bible and I read something. I can't tell you what I read, but I read something. And I prayed and I said, Jesus, if you are God, you'll heal me tonight. Because for 23 days, I had not slept at all. Wow. I was from insomnia, but not even a wink of sleep, no matter what I did. Not even Valium would make me sleep. 14 days of Valium did not even make me sleep. But that night I said, if you really are God, then you're going to heal me. And if I get healed, I will serve you forever. Well, that night I fell off to sleep after 23 wow. nights. And when I got up, I made a quality decision against all odds, against what family would say. Um, I decided I was going to serve him. And it's now many, many years. <laughs> and I'm 68 years old, but I've never turned away from the Lord Jesus Christ. But that was a starting point. Yes, that was a seed, a major seed of hope. Wow, wow. What a powerful seed and what a powerful uh, story, you know, of how you came to know God. Yes, very powerful. Then your second part of the question, you know, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know him as father straight away. I, I didn't know him as father. And yet I was looking for a father because I had lost my dad. My dad was my world. He was my hero. He was my provider. He was my protector. He was everything to me. And when I lost dad, life became very, very fearful, uh, very depressing. And uh, I didn't know the Lord Jesus, you know, as father or God as father. It took me a long time. Uh, but I knew him as Lord. I knew him as master because I was a servant. I wanted to please him. I served him for many years. I knew him as king. I was a subject in the kingdom, totally surrendered to his lordship. And uh, strangely enough, it was only about 12 years ago that, you know, when I became very ill, and I thought I was yeah. going to die. Many years of serving God, walking with him and knowing how faithful he is. But it was only about 12 or 13 years ago that I became very ill and I thought I was gonna die. And then I started questioning God, you know, if you are for real, why would I be so sick? You know, uh, yeah. for three months I wrestled. I wrestled with the fact that did God 
uh, give up on me? Uh, you know, does God not love me enough? Have I made a mistake? I walk with tremendous condemnation as to whether I did something seriously wrong for God to then abandon me. All of these thoughts. But I think the biggest giant that really rose up in my heart was a giant of unbelief. I started to an extent struggle with belief. And for three months, the Lord got me in a place where he said to me, I want you to read the book of Job. And I sat and finished it in one night. I didn't sleep at all. From chapter 1 to 42, I read the whole book of Job. But it was one statement that caught me. And that was a statement of Job 42.5. And it says, Job said, I knew you were the hearing of the ears, but now my eye seeth thee. And I started to examine that statement. And I said, is it possible, Lord, that I knew you were the hearing of the ears? But I've never really had a direct one-to-one -one revelation of who you are. And it yes. was at that point in those three months that I got to know God as my father. Suddenly something happened. Suddenly there was a connection in my heart of not knowing God, just as Lord, Master, Savior, King. But I began yeah. to know him as my father. And it is then that I started to study the word on sonship and begin to understand what it is that would bring me into a place of becoming a son of God rather than just a follower, rather than just a servant, rather than just a subject in the kingdom. But what does it mean to become a son of God? And that sparked off many new things for me. So mm. yes, you know, our journey, our journey is not complete when you give your life to the Lord. It's a, it's a long journey. But ultimately, I believe that the finality is, or the place of maturity really is, the place of comfort is really to find yourself uh, in God as your father and you as his son. Wow, that's, that's really profound and also exciting to know that even though after many years of serving God that you struggled with belief, you know, exactly. thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you for sharing yeah. that. That's, that really is comforting to so many of us, you know. Um, you know, you're, you're speaking about something really profound here. You're speaking about a father's son versus a father's slave or a father's servant. And what is the distinction? What is the, the difference in, in, in that space? Um, yeah, just to get back again to the unbelief issue. I could believe God for provision. Yes. I could believe God for protection. But, you know, to believe God in the finished work is not easy. That he's yeah. completed all things on my behalf. That his purposes will prevail over my present circumstances. So even if I'm critically ill, the purposes yeah. of God will prevail over that. And that is what I struggled with. And I think that became a major revelation for me. That God's purposes can never be trampled upon. If God has chosen for me to walk in yes. his eternal purpose, I will. But uh, coming back to your question, how does a son supersede uh, the, the inheritance or rather supersede the identity of a servant. Yes. Um, uh, there's a very big difference. The son is a prototype of the father. A servant can be like a son in the same home serving mm. somebody, but will never be a prototype. And that's the difference between Adam, I believe, and Christ. Adam, the Bible says, was created in the image of God. And that right. word image there, Salem, is actually a replica or in the shadow of God. But Christ is the prototype. In other words, the essence and the makeup of Christ as a son of God is the very same essence that is in the Father. So that's one, because you'll find that uh, when, we, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are born again. The Bible says we are not born of flesh. We are not born of man. Uh, we are not born of the physical, but we are born again of the spirit. That means there's a spiritual change in our DNA. We are completely new people. We might not see it completely in our bodies, in the mm. physical yet, but definitely inside of us, the Holy Spirit is carrying the DNA of the Father, which makes us not just servants, not just somebody who relates to God, but actual sons of God, who are the beloved of God, carrying the very blueprint of God, his essence, therefore we prototype. So that's the first. 
The second yes. is no father hands over an inheritance to a servant. Yes. To a son. Now, you know that Abraham sought God uh, initially, and he said to God, he said, I don't have children. So do you think Eliezer will be my inheritor? Yes. Will he inherit, you know, uh, yes. what I have? Because God has gi had given Abraham uh, very great promises that his mm. inheritance will be like the sand on the seashore and yes. like the stuff. Yes. So he couldn't understand how this was possible. And God said, it can't be because uh, he's your servant. And then a little later on, when Ishmael was born, again, he sought God. He said, now that Ishmael is born, he's born out of my loins. He is my son. Will Ishmael now be the one who will inherit? And God yes. said, he can't either. He might be your son, but he's not the legitimate heir. In other words, yes. he's not the seed of promise. Uh, you will have the seed of promise. And we know that Isaac came along. So like that in our lives, when we are like Eliezer, we find ourselves as servants of God. We will not shift into this position of walking as princes with God, as walking as heirs of God and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom will not become a reality for us. And then, of course, forcing anything like Ishmael will also yeah. not become a reality. But one that is born again of the spirit, one that is legitimately a son of God, carrying the very identity of the father, now becomes the heir of God and a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the difference between servant. That is why uh, I believe that presently, there's a war being raged on the earth, Nishani. We must take note of that. Evil is reaching its ripeness. We must not get too worried about it because God is allowing evil, wickedness, sin to reach ripeness. You know, presently, the kind of sin we are seeing and the kind of evil we are seeing in the earth, we've never seen these things before. No, no, we've never. The whole earth is being shaken. And we must understand that the devil was kicked out of heaven. So he's made his domain on the earth and everything that he's been involved in. Remember, God uses us. He speaks through us. God right. inhabits like that. The enemy also works through people to kill, destroy, murder, hate, and so on. And so uh, the enemy must also be dethroned now on the earth. And it's going to take sons to dethrone him because the, the devil is an angel. Angels yes. are servants. So there's going to be a shift now, even in the jurisdictional right on the earth where sons will rule and reign. And this is why even this lockdown period is so important that we prepare well for the next level of war because the kingdom is about to manifest on the earth. Sure, that's quite profound. You know, um, looking at the, the level of evilness and the level of corruption and just thinking about how unsafe our, especially our women and children are. Um, you know, the, the shooting of Nathaniel this week really broke our, broke my heart, you know, broke our yeah. heart. That was yeah. really sad. So the level of evil is not even, um, it, it's hectic. It's hectic. And yet, you know, so when you say the sons need to take back that throne and, and inherit, um, firstly, what, what, how do you become a son? How how do you move from servanthood? How do you get that DNA um, and, and inheritance into, you know, into your being? Okay. Every child of God who is born again and filled with the spirit already has the DNA of the father in the spirit. The right. Holy Spirit carries the fullness of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit carries the full blueprint of the nature, the character, the personality, the essence of life of God the Father, and he is already in us. It is our duty to unravel, to understand. It is our duty to be enlightened concerning the Spirit of God who is in us. Once we are enlightened about the Holy Spirit, you'll find that 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us, the mm -hmm. Lord is the Spirit. If the Lord is the Spirit, we cannot separate the Lord from his Spirit. We cannot separate God the Father from his spirit because yes. the spirit given to us is the spirit of the Father. So in unraveling, in understanding, 
in being enlightened about the, the fullness of the spirit. And you know that the Holy Spirit is sevenfold. There are yes. seven revelations. It's one of the books I've written that's very interesting on how to uncover the fullness of the spirit within you. You know, we've just known him in the church world as the Holy Spirit. Sometimes yeah. we've known him as the wind, a ghost, a holy ghost. But we need to know him intimately. intimately. He is, yes. And when we know him, I believe we're in the season where the fullness of the spirit is manifesting within human flesh. And when the fullness of the spirit manifests within human flesh, God himself manifests from within us. And Ephesians 3 is an excellent example when the Bible says that we might be filled with the spirit, reinforced and strengthened with mighty power by the Holy Spirit in us, that yes. Christ may dwell by faith in our hearts so that together with the saints, we will know how high and deep and long and wide the love of God really is, that we might be filled with the fullness of God. I mean, what an amazing, yeah. amazing uh, uh, um, act on behalf of God that we human beings, weaklings who struggled with our lives, that we should be filled with the fullness of God, having the richest measure of the divine presence of God within us. This is God's will. The church has not moved into a place of rulership, of excellence, of, 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 of authority and dominion, because we don't know who we really are. If we understand how sons are viewed from God's side, we will begin to take our positions as rightfully standing on behalf of our father, rightfully becoming custodians of that which belongs to our father, executing the will, the dominion and the authority of our father in the earth. And that's where we have to come to. Yeah, that's, that's quite powerful because you're speaking a little bit about identity and about positioning. Um, that's right. Can you just share a little bit about, let, let's talk a little bit about identity as, as sons and, and how that comes about and how, what that actually means. Because, you know, when I first heard the term and people would say it all the time and I was going like, oh, I don't like the word son because I want to be a child of God, you know, because... I'm a woman and, uh, and and I mean that's just the reality that's just me you know like being being myself um but let's talk about identity and gender and what that what that really translates to in the sonship so that we have right. clarity on the matter yes firstly uh, there are different levels to sonship you know when you're born again you're a child right. of god that's wonderful you have to be a child it's like a, yeah. it, the word is taken on there you're still a child of God. You're still growing. You still need tutors, governors to guide you. Um, you still need to be taught by people to grow up. You eventually yes. grow up and there comes a stage in your life when you become a mature son of God. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came into right. the earth, he set a pattern. He became the pattern son. He was actually God in the flesh. And I think we know that the Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word yeah. became flesh. So he was yeah. really God who came to the earth, but he came as a son to show us our designation that this is who you are called to be. He didn't just come to die and save us. He came to show us a pattern, a journey, a pathway to life. Now, if we follow that pathway, we will see that the Lord Jesus at 12 years old was busy teaching the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, yes. the educated people. And, yes. uh, you know, and they were astounded by his teaching. And uh, eventually when his parents came and they took him away, they were worried about him. The Bible says he submitted to them and uh, he went away with them and he grew in stature and he grew in wisdom. Mm -hmm. But we noticed that he comes back again on the scene around 30 years of 30. age. Yes, And this time when he enters the scene, he enters, not that he was not a mature son, but he wanted to show us, this is what we need to do. And he comes back at 30, and then he shows us what a mature son is like. Now, I want to say that, you know, in the natural, we have fathers. Yeah. We have natural fathers. And our natural fathers are there to guide us, teach us, grow us, disciple us, and even discipline us. Maybe they didn't do a very good job, but still, our fathers were our heroes. You know, yeah. they were there. We also have people that will tutor us like fathers. Yes. We have fathers 
in the faith, we call them. They tutor us, they guide us. I grew because there were many people who, who helped me. They taught me, they grew me. Uh, these are fathers in the faith who train our souls. But ultimately our resting place is in the bosom of our father. The yes. father of all spirits, the father of all people. Now God, our father has created everything that you see, not just the Christian. He's created yes. everything, every everything. person. There's nothing that you see, both seen, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say see, but even in the unseen world yeah. that God did not create. Everything has come out of his own womb. He has a right to everything, but whether everyone and everything will submit to him is truly the question. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ came on the scene and the Bible says there are a few titles that were given to him. They were not really titles, but he was called a son of man. Yes, then he was called a son of God. Yeah. Then he was called the beloved of God. And then he was called a uh, begotten of God. He was the only begotten of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. He was also part of the company that was called the son. Notice sometimes in John 5, especially, he uses the expression the son very often. Yeah. Now, son of man teaches us that every one of us must subject ourselves and submit ourselves to somebody who can tutor, teach, and grow us. Now, you know a lot about that, uh, yes. you know, especially yes. when you were younger, you were a young, you're part of the youth team, and you know how far you've come. When you look back, you see if you uh -huh. didn't have the initial training, uh, it wouldn't have brought you so far. You could have been lost on the way. The same for me and the same for everybody else. Son of God is we're all called to be sons of God, every one of us. And like I spoke about the prototype, we are not just named son of God, we're carrying the image. Now the image inside of us through the Holy Spirit is the image of God. Remember what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, it says, uh, nobody knows God better than his own spirit. For the spirit of God knows even the deep and the bottomless things of God. So who can reveal God best to you but his spirit? Then the Bible also says in Ephesians 4 spirit, yeah. that we, will, we must all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now Christ, the word yeah. Christ means anointed. Christ is actually God coming to humanity through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So the anointing emerges out of the anointing and the character and nature the anointed Christ emerges out of the anointing that you're carrying the Holy Spirit the person now is seen within the anointing the person of God Godhead yeah. deity the presence of God that is why the Bible says if the same spirit dwells in you raised Jesus from the dead then the, the spirit who raised Christ from the dead is also able to make alive your mortal body. How? By the power that is within you. Uh, Shani, we have been looking outside for too long. We've been crying to God, looking up at the skies for too long. We've been looking all around us, hoping God yeah. will manifest somewhere outside. We have yeah. not looked sufficiently inside of us where the Holy Spirit dwells. And that's why the Bible also says in Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do super abundantly above our thinking, our asking, our dreaming, imagining. Imagining. and our imagining by the power that is within you. So where's the identity of God? Already within you. Within me. Already within you. You have to discover the identity. So it's, it's a decision like this. Your soul wants to make a decision. Will your soul side with your flesh? Or will your soul side with the spirit within you? Every time you make a decision, for instance, somebody's really hurt you. The yeah. spirit within you tells you, my identity loves even those who hate me. Yeah. But the flesh says, no, they hurt you very badly. You cannot love them anymore. Mm. Now, who will you side with? Every time you side with the spirit within you, the identity of your soul man, who you are, is changed. Mm. And there's a constant renewing and a constant transformation taking place inside of us until the full nature of God, according to Ephesians 4, 13, 
which says that we might all come to the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature the full, of, of the fullness, fullness of Christ, until we become a mature man having the full personality, character, nature of Christ, nothing short of that fullness. That's where we're heading for. Here and now. Here, Here and, and now. now. Yeah. Here and now. It's not impossible yeah. because you're not carrying it out. You're knowing about it, but you're not carrying it out. Who's carrying this out? The power within you. But you see, as soon as you see something, you can have it. God said to Abraham, as far as your eyes can see, you can have it. Yeah. yeah. We see these things, we can have them. A walk <laughs> into them. take a moment that's so profound. Yes. Just so profound. That's so profound. But it's also so exciting. So what, what is the... I mean, what do you, what do you, what is your, your view on, or your thinking, or what is God saying to you about sonship in this pandemic and in the shift, this global shift? What is, what is our position as sons? Okay, I just Don't want to finish something that you also asked earlier about gender. Now, yes. this is not a, yeah, this is not a gender thing. It's not about okay. a male father and a male son. It's the principle, it's the function that surrounds a fa father-son relationship. It's the function and okay. it's a principle of God. So we understand that it has nothing to do with male and female. In other words, even if you're female, you are called to be a son of God. Uh, mm -hmm. When you talk about sonship in this pandemic, I think it's very critical because um, we're about to see the earth now handed to sons. Because the Bible says, uh, if you read Hebrews chapter one, the Bible says, to no servant did God ever commit, or to no angel did God ever commit the earth. Uh, but to the son, he said, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. And in uh, Psalms two, he says, uh, uh, I have set my king on my holy hill Zion. Now in Psalms two, you'll also find God is preparing mm. us and he says, I've set my, my king on my holy hill, Zion. I've declared the decree. You are my son. This day have I begotten you. But he goes on to say, be ye wise, O ye kings, and be ye instructed, O ye judges. In this present pandemic, we might see the lockdown as something that has been orchestrated against the church meeting. And I don't believe so. I truly believe the lockdown was given to us to prepare that we as sons of God, needed to expedite our journey and shift quickly to the finish or shift quickly to maturity so that we are instructed as judges. Mm. And we are wise as sons and as kings because the next level of walk is going to cause us to shift into a place of ruling and reigning in the kingdom. Now, I want to say again, this is not the kind of ruling and reigning that has to do with, you know, a glitter and glamour that has to do with a literal throne or, yeah. or some kind of, of, of shiny garb, but it is bringing the rule of God, bringing the law of God into the earth so that harmony, peace, reconciliation to God will come again. For instance, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we are called to be ambassadors of heaven. The son is called yeah. to be an ambassador of his father, an ambassador of heaven. And he says, and we've been given the ministry of reconciliation that, we, that God will make his yes. appeal to us. The father makes his appeal through the son to reconcile the earth back to himself. So what's going to happen to the earth? Yeah. All these murderers and all the rapists that have been led by the devil who has come to kill, steal and destroy. Uh, these are not our enemies. These are people that God created, but they lost their way. Yeah. They lost their way to the father. Yeah. They lost the way to the one who created them. Now, when a mature son steps out, you're the eldest in your home, am I right? Yes, I am. I, am. I always try Not to the most mature the family, <laughs> from the eldest to the youngest. And I'm sure Not you played a major role amongst your brothers and sisters. And you still do even now. They look up to you because your mom and dad are not around. Like that in the body of Christ, God has a company of sons who have given themselves, who are called, selected, chosen, elected for such a time as this, who have given themselves to maturity, who have grown, have been instructed in the word. Mm -hmm. And because they have done this, more so now in the lockdown, 
than ever before. I cannot tell you how much God has actually spoken to me in this lockdown. Not that he's not done this before, but I've just had the time to give it, you know, to him. So what will happen is a company of mature sons are going to take the overall uh, jurisdiction over the earth to bring God's people back into reconciliation with him. Harmony, peace, and joy will reign again on the earth. And we've got to prepare for that. Hmm. Hmm. So that 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 is that that is That's what's going uh, to happen. Wow, wow. We've got we've got a question from um from Facebook on your you spoke about Ella's um Abraham's servant. Yeah. How do you just say it? <laughs> Sorry, I can't say it. Eliezer. Um, Eliezer. So just to, to elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah. That's a, yeah. Look, Eliezer was very faithful to Abraham, extremely uh, faithful. He grew up as a son in Abraham's house. But I think God was showing Abraham and showing us also um, exactly what was required. Now, in the, in, in, in the kingdom, you'll have servants, those who are very happy just to be servants. Because to be a son means there's a tremendous responsibility on your shoulder. I'm sure yeah. you heard the Lord Jesus many times say, I only do what I hear my father. I only do what I see my father doing. And I only yeah. speak what I hear my father speaking. You lose your life. The son that we're talking about has no life of his own. The only life this yes. son, this mature son has is the life of the father. Now, God wanted to show us yeah. a pattern. It will not be yeah. one who's a servant and will never reach. It doesn't mean the servant won't be saved. This is not salvation, Nishani, yes. we are talking yeah. about. We are talking about the gospel of the kingdom. We are talking about dethroning the forces of darkness. And we are talking about a brand new release for the whole earth right now. So a servant will not be able to rule on behalf of the father. You know that even in your own life, you won't give your servant rulership over your house. Your child will have rulership over your mm -hmm. house because your child carries your blueprint. And then the, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the child also, Ishmael, that was born was illegitimate, though the son, this was the son of Abraham. But it yes. was not God's will. It was not God's purpose. It was forced. So neither can he do. He rule on behalf of God either. So that's why God is saying we cannot force this. It's, we cannot be illegitimate rulers. In other words, there has to be a legitimate ruler. You'll also notice how the father himself authenticated the Lord Jesus. Yeah. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I oh, am well pleased. Yeah. This has yeah. nothing to do with salvation. That's why on the Mount of Transfiguration, you will see Jesus, Moses, and Elijah in Matthew yeah. verse 17. Yeah. And you see how Peter, James, and John as a first fruit company the, not the whole, not all 12 disciples went. It was just the three. He took this mm -hmm. mature company when the heavenly things were revealed. And when they went up the mount, the Bible says, Moses and Elijah appeared. Peter hoped he could keep all three together. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. He said, yeah. let's build three tabernacles. But the Bible says a cloud overshadowed them. And Moses and Elijah moved out of the way. And the voice of the father said, this is my son. Hear ye him. What was he saying? Mm -hmm. It's not the day. It is not the day of the law. It is not the day of the prophets. It's the day of the son. The time for sonship, mature sonship, has finally come. Wow. I mean, that, that then leads on to the, because of the power is within us. You know, it, it, it's so interesting because all this, um, there's been a lot of counterfeit, you know, I yes. don't want to name it or label it, but there's been a lot of counterfeit and a lot of things about, you know, going within, love within, power within, you know, all kinds of, of things leading up to this. But you're speaking about true sonship. You're speaking about a mandate that we're going to need to execute soon on this earth. Yeah. And so, so I'm, I'm, I'm just curious and I'm asking out of my own interest because I don't have any questions prepared. Um, okay, but but like you know, I I want to be ready. I want to be geared. I want to be. I'm excited right now. Everything is is turning inside of me. I just want to jump up, you know. Um, 
because I do know that there's been a shift in these last few months in my relationship with God, you know, in my, in, in literally physically in my, in my coming in, into my dying of self as well, you know, so I mean, I, I'm excited and, I, and I'm excited to see what's happening, how, where, what, how, I don't want to miss it, I just don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. And we're speaking about heavenly things here. We're speaking about dethroning. We're speaking about spiritual things and spiritual war, which is which is like, it almost feels like all of our lives we've been training for this. You know, yeah. we've been building muscle. We've been building competency. And, you know, if you think about the long, longevity of some of the struggles many of us have been through, all of us in life, it was to build capability and, you know, uh, muscle muscle strength spiritual muscle strength so i'm getting excited when you say the time is yeah. here you know for god to to position us as sons yeah look i feel convinced in my heart that uh, the pandemic we're going through is not a local or a national one but it is certainly mm -hmm. a a global one and because it's a global pandemic one can see clearly that god is dealing with the whole earth all at once secondly we also yeah. notice that God is dealing with every facet of living. It is not just a virus, but it is every facet of living that has been affected, whether it's the economic or the social or the physical, the psychological, uh, spiritual, yes. every facet of living yeah. has been touched. There is nothing that has not yes. been exposed in the season and there's nothing that has not been shaken in the season. Everything is shaken, including yeah. the church. The church is also shaken. Many of us were shaken to yes. see whether we're going to stand in the season. Now, you know, yes. the Lord Jesus Christ, I said earlier on, was the pattern son. And the journey he walked, he didn't walk for himself. He didn't need to walk that journey. He walked this journey for us. Now, Paul said a thing like this in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 30. He said uh, that I may know him, uh, yeah. that I may know him uh, in the power of the resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering, that I may yeah. know him both. So many people in the body of Christ give up in the area of the suffering. So mm. why is the suffering there? The suffering is really to bring the old man uh, to death and to allow the Christ man to arise. Now, we know that we have all come from Adam. While we do have, we also know that we've come from some physical father and mother when we were born. But yeah. originally, we have all emanated from the root or the foundation, Adam. And we've carried that sin. The Bible says through one man's sin, uh, uh, unrighteousness entered the world and every man succumbed to death because of mm. the one man's sin. But the wonderful thing about coming into Christ is that in Christ, we are a new creation. Yes. All things All have things passed happens. away. The word yeah. passed away is the same as died. Yes. Uh, same word. So, so our, our, our inheritance or rather our origin is no more Adam. It's no more Eve. That's why I find Nishani, even with treating women so badly in the church, or, or, or keep talking about women coming from uh, the line of Eve, and woman's yes. sin, not man, and so on and so on, is really null and void in the season not, for me. Yes. Because we are not part of the Eve company. We are yes. all now part of Christ. Yes. For the Bible says in Christ, there's neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond nor free. So we have a brand new life in Christ. Now, it is very important for us, if we're going to shift into the next stage of our walk, that we understand Christ's life. We all know that Christ moved, or the Lord Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, ascended mm. and sat at the right hand of the Father as a right-hand son, the son of the right hand, as a firstborn son, sat on at the right hand of the Father until the enemies, his enemies, are made his footstool. Now, there's no yes. enemies in heaven. These enemies are on the earth. they got to be made the footstool of God. And we know when the Lord Jesus Christ walked on the earth, the devil cried out to him a few times. Why have you come to persecute us before our time? So they knew there's coming a persecution eventually. But why yes. are you persecuting us so early? So now, before, I want to say also, sorry. Before the time, yeah. yeah. Before our time. 
So I yeah. want to say also that that function at the right hand of the father is very critical. Remember Ephesians 2, 5 tells us we are seated, seated. Yeah. in Christ on the right hand of the throne. Right. We are seated. It's past tense. That means in the spirit dimension, it is finished. It means God purposed it and God saw it. But we have to mature to reach that position. It's not a physical position where we're going to leave the earth now and find the throne above the sky and sit yeah. there. It's positional. In other words, we now have been given the authority as sons of God to rule and reign on his behalf as right-hand sons. Now, there's an interesting scripture for me in the book of Hebrews 6.19. And it says, we have this hope as an anchor of the soul, mm. which is steadfast and is anchored beyond the veil, where Christ yeah. sits at the right hand of the Father. Now, the Bible says he was a forerunner. Forerunner yeah. means he ran on behalf of those that were still coming, if he's a forerunner. So we've still come into that position and our souls are anchored into that position already. What is that position? The Bible says as the Melchizedek of God. Now, what is Melchizedek? Melchizedek is a priest unto God and a king on the earth. In other words, you cannot rule and reign on the earth if you have no link with God. In other words, you're totally joined to the heavens. You're joined to a father as a son. And that father now legitimizes your authority in the earth. And on the earth, you can reign on, on his behalf. And eventually, yeah. scriptures like, you know, the heart of a king is in the hand of God. He moves it like waters the way he wants to. And yes. a king who sits on a throne of righteousness will scatter evil with his eyes. When we step out as mature sons, fully enlightened of our commission and our commitment to our father already being authenticated, disclosed, revealed as sons of God, we will scatter evil. The devil will also cry out to us and say, why have you come to persecute me? But he won't say before the time because it is the time. Mm. I believe we'll reach that time now. Wow. Wow. And, you know, we spoke a lot about the church. What, what do you believe is the role of the, the local pastor um, in, play, in the father-son relationship? The local pastor, you know, you have the fivefold ministry, which is functional. Yeah. Not, it's not uh, one with titles. It's not for titles, yes. Evangelists and pastor, that and so on. Yeah. It has nothing to do with titles. It's functional. But yeah. every leader yeah. in Every church, first and foremost, must be a father to the flock because you're revealing God to your flock. You might function as a pastor who takes care of the flock. You might function as a teacher, a very good teacher who's able to break the word and feed the flock. You might function as an evangelist where you deal with sin and you bring people to God or as a prophet or as an apostle bringing the design of God. But ultimately, your position in a church as a local pastor has got to be one of a father. In other words, everyone that God sends to you, you got to train them. And I would say, I love the scripture that Paul uses in, in, in Galatians 4.19. He says, I travail again in birth for you until yeah. Christ be formed in you. Our commission should be not to keep people dependent on us, not to keep people as little children and we carry a title. Yeah. I'm the pastor and you just my subject, never. But it is to bring people to a place where they perfected in Christ. We've got to feed them until they are so mature. Watch they them. Stand up. <laughs> yes, they can stand up as mature sons of God in the earth. And that's our commission. Mm -hmm. And during this lockdown, Nishani, I have been sending teachings and not just any teaching, but directly linked to the epidemic. Every mm -hmm. single day for 90 days now our church as well as everyone that relates to me in any way whether they're friends or they relate to me in some way or the other i daily send out a clip preparing them each day for where we're about to enter and i said to them we're about i can see the light beginning to shine now we're about to come to the conclusion so let's prepare well We've just got a few more issues to deal with, and I believe we're on our way. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, in terms of just being uh, such a 
proactive sort of local without the title but the local fathering and the local pastoring yeah. you know i've yeah. i've i've been um i must uh, confess i i google you i stalk you on social media <laughs> that's right <laughs> because because of the the nuggets and the, um, the profound truths that god brings through you you know you'll say the word doesn't belong to me it's not me it's, it's I, I know that's what you're going to say so yes. so so it's beautiful profound truths and one of the things that i loved was your illustration of how you depict spiritual uh, childbirth and the sperma you know and how god plants within you something that you have to carry to fruition and sometimes yes. it's not easy to travail in that period maybe just elaborate a little bit about that because it feels that we've been incubating you know there are many mysteries you know marriage is a mystery yes and uh, you know we understand Mary paul said marriage is a mystery childbirthing is also a mystery and uh, we're not going to talk about the marriage mystery but let's talk about the childbirthing mystery the mystery of childbearing is that the sperm enters a womb but mm. the womb has to give the egg to receive the yes. sperm. Yeah. If the womb does not release the egg, then the sperm is lost, even though the sperm carries life. And, uh, and when the two meet, then the incubation takes place. Mm. And then there's a gestation period. You got to wait for that period until that fruit is fully formed in order to be released. And I like that the word of God is very important. The word of God in the Greek is sperma. <laughs> Uh, yes. it, it really is. It, it's a divine sperma of God. It is, it is carrying life. Now, when that sperma, when that word enters our hearts, we can't just take it lightly. You can't, you know, you can never take any word lightly. Just listen yeah. to a good word and say, wow, that's a good word. No, we've got to contemplate. We've got to think about, we've got to meditate on that word. It's just like the sower who went to sow seed. You know, yeah. some people wayside they received nothing others had hardened hearts the seed sprouted and died others the cares of the world killed it but even amongst the group that received it there were three different groups the one group only brought 30 fold of that seed the other group brought 60 fold of the seed the mature yeah. son now there's the mature son the mature son is going to bring 100 fold of that seed so you notice how the Lord spoke to the, to, uh, about the Israelites in Hebrews chapter 4. He said they received the same word as you and me. But because they did not give it the faith it required, they were termed people with wicked, wicked hearts of unbelief. They never entered the promises of God. So if we do not give our hearts like that egg to receive the word, to allow that word to be engrafted, Mm. embedded and graved in our hearts then unfortunately we have not actually done justice to the word and that's why the bible says god wants to write his word in our hearts until we become the living epistle of god it must yeah. be read by people they the world won't read the bible yeah some christians many honest. christians don't read the bible too you know they don't give time to the bible the world won't read the Bible. They're going to read you. And when they read you, who will they read? They will read God. They will, they will be attracted to God inside of you. And they will come back. Remember, they came out of God, everyone. It doesn't yeah. matter what religion or what nation or tribe they belong to. Everyone mm. came out of the bowels of God. They're going to go back there. So when we receive the word and we have allowed it to be embedded in our hearts, we've got to now give time for that word. And what happens is it is going to bear forth. It's gonna bring forth. Now, if you take the word Christ and hmm. everything around Christ, the son of the living God, and you've sown his life in your heart through the word, but the Holy Spirit is also carrying his life, remember? What yes. will happen is you must birth the mature son. You become the mature son. Hmm has a lot to do with the word the word is uh, the word is really the blueprint and structure yeah i loved I, i'll never forget you know one of the things growing up uh, you know as a youth under your ministry was that particular verse the word is um living sharper than two any two-edged sword to the division of bone and marrow you know soul yes. and spirit um and i almost can hear, still hear your voice uh, saying that often in my life so yeah <laughs> 
Um, tell us a little bit, I mean, you're doing a series now, and you're doing something quite exciting, talking about the perfect heart. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so uh, one, you know, there are seven different facets to the perfect heart. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the facets is that the heart must become the issuer of life. Because mm -hmm. you see, Jesus said, these people draw near to me with their mouths and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. When we yeah. become a genuine people and the flow is from the heart, anything we do on the outside will be genuine. You can say to a man, pick up your mat and walk and he will walk. Because right. genuinely from your heart, you really want the man to walk. You're not just yeah. interested in the miracle. You see, yeah. you could be interested in the miracle and somebody can grab a nice shot of you and put it in the newspaper. And, yeah. uh, but your intent and purpose is not that the poor yeah. cripple should walk again. You understand? Yeah. So God yeah. is dealing with the motives of the heart. The second uh, part of the heart is that the heart must become brightly lit like the sun. Second Peter 1 19 says we do well if we heed this word. It is like a light shining in a squalid and a dark area until the day breaks and the day star arises in your heart. Now how does a day star oh. arise in your heart? Yeah. In other words, oh. your heart is become like the sun. Now the only yes. way your heart can become like the sun is when your heart is enlightened by the word of God, by the truth of God and lightning upon lightning, and eventually, you know, there's no shadow in your heart. Then the third one is that the heart is the throne of God. Yeah. The Bible tells us, Paul says, do not give place to anything in your heart that will take the place of God, because God wants to rule and reign from our hearts. Uh, remember the scripture, Psalms 132, where the Lord says, I have chosen Zion. I've made yeah. Zion my dwelling place. This mm. is my eternal dwelling place. And I would say to my people, you are my Zion. So Zion is not a mountain in Israel. It might be physically. Yeah. Zion is no mountain in the heaven. We are the Zion That's of God. Zion. And yeah. God wants his throne to be established in our hearts, which is the Zion. And how does your heart become the Zion of God? When you're an overcomer. Mm. There are many things in the season set not to destroy you, not because God doesn't see what's happening, not because God wants to frighten you or judge you. It's because God is bringing you to a place where there will be nothing in the earth that will overcome you, but rather you will overcome oh. all things. Yeah. So your heart becomes a Zion of God and God dwells in your heart. Your heart also becomes the issue of living waters. Remember what Jesus said, out of your heart will flow the issues of living waters. Yeah. Yes. So the perfect heart is very important. And there are seven facets to this perfect heart. And we need to take note of all seven facets. But there are many things that God deals with in this time of the perfect heart. What are the issues that he will deal with? One of them, like I said, is going to be the enlightening. What do you have to sow into your heart to bring light? Light yeah. upon light. Then there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. The Bible says, it's as if we are looking in a mirror. We are staring at the word of God. And we are being transfigured and transformed oh into God. that word or that image from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory. So the oh. heart must be a glorious position in your life and in the earth. That's where God rules and reigns from. That's a mystery. You know, like childbearing is a mystery. Marriage yeah. is a mystery. Christ is the biggest mystery ever. And what is Christ? God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, dwelling within human flesh through the anointing in the hearts of men. So the devil's getting a big shock when he realizes God is present in human flesh. He can't yes. destroy flesh any longer. Yeah, and you know it takes away from all these um, old, uh, you know, old sort of Sunday school kind of images of, um, you know, God being somewhere out there, <laughs> you know, and, and we've got to become these almost, you know, yeah. there was uh, a celestial being, place. celestial beings, yeah. you know, celestial beings yeah. to kind of yeah. uh, experience Him in the fullness. Um, yeah, it, 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 uh, it brings a whole new revelation of who God is. Yeah. yeah. There was a place for that at a time, but now that yeah. we are mature, we don't think like children, we don't speak like children. We're entering the place of maturity now. 
And I think mm. teaching is very important, you know. Uh, God has elected a people who will bring, a, a, you know, like architects, uh, yes. you know, wise master builders yes. who will bring, uh, who will bring uh, grace and truth who will bring uh, uh, the divine blueprint of heaven, who will bring and show us the image of God. And we must submit ourselves to the teaching because when we start to grow in this teaching, it actually, re it actually redesigns and re uh, reconfigures us into the proper design because the things we learned have caused us to have a design in our internal mechanism that's not accurate. But when yes. we receive truth, it will redesign us in the inner man so that we can become all that God, all that God is having yeah. his image. That's the whole issue of father and son. It's the fact that the son is the prototype, the exact makeup of the father. Wow. Wow. That's so profound. And there's been so many nuggets and so much truth. It's, um, you know, it's something that I'm going to have to go and listen to again <laughs> and again. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add as we come to the, the end of an hour? I can't believe we've been chatting for an hour already. Yeah, I know. I'd firstly like to chat to, to women because I know that to an extent it's Women's Month and so on. To let women know that you're also a son of God. Do not ever feel inferior. We are not less than. I pray that the church will begin to understand this mm -hmm. and the church will stop treating women as being lesser than men or being yeah. lesser. In the marriage, women are sub subject to their husbands. But women are not lesser than men. Uh, yes. They carry the image of God also. And together, man and woman will bring the fullness of God in the earth. Now, if the church can truly understand that, then the world will follow that standard that the church sets. It's no wonder the world is destroying women because they feel and they think that women are less than, uh, you know, they are mm -hmm. of no value. So firstly, I'd like to say that to, to the woman. And then secondly, I'd like to say to everybody in the church world, this is not a season for us to fear, cringe. Uh, it is not a, 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 a season for us to retreat, become worried or anxious. Uh, it is a season for us to prepare well. Let's give ourselves to accurate preparation. We're about to step out. God is about to bring us out because we're in a very profound season. This is not an ordinary season. This is a season of great truth. But one of the things that God is showing me also is the Lord Jesus, before he entered into his glory, he said, the prince of this world cometh and findeth nothing in me. Nothing yeah. belongs to him is in me. Church, I'd like to say to you, the prince of this world must not find anything in you that belongs to him. And when that happens, then you have the charge over him. But if anything of his belongs to you, any kind of whether it's unbelief or whether it's transgression or condemnation or whatever, then unfortunately you don't have, uh, you don't have the hold over him. So let's prepare and just have nothing to do with him. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, very, very uh, good, <laughs> good advice. And thank you also for the, you know, for the, for the truth spoken about women. It's, it's something very close to my own heart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all righty. So we've come to the end of the hour and I almost don't want to let you go. That's the truth. <laughs> that's the truth. And um, I find myself sort of trying to, to absorb everything that's just happened. So, so thank you for, for being so powerful and being so instrumental in so many of our lives. And I think mainly for your obedience, your obedience to, to God and, and for hearing his heart. So you know, keeping your head head to his chest, you know, uh, because we've grown. We've grown because you're here, you know. Um, we've grown because um, we we also stalk you and check you out on Facebook and everything. <laughs> so, Amen. so That's what yeah, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. You know, it, it is a time where the body of, uh, of Christ is coming together and it's transcending church boundaries and geographic boundaries and even global boundaries. It's amazing how close everybody is um, reconnecting and, and, and almost netting together. Um, so I, I usually, you know, say goodbye, but I'd like you to please pronounce a blessing over us as we go. Um, and um, yeah, I'd like you to end today. <laughs> Okay, no problem. Welcome. Father, we just want to thank you for this time together. It's been a great time 
of conversations, heavenly conversations. I thank you that we are not citizens of the earth, we are citizens of the heavens. And therefore we are on the earth and every conversation and every word that is pronounced, every declaration, decree that is pronounced, even through the airwaves, will be heard. The Bible mm -hmm. says by principalities and powers, it will be heard unto the ends of the earth. Your word is powerful, it is your word. We know that we are led by your spirit, so we take no glory for anything that is done in the season, except for the fact that we want to thank you that we can offer ourselves as conduits of life. We can offer ourselves as the Ark of the Covenant from where mercy will flow to all people. Lord, I pray for everyone listening to this recording, everyone listening to the live broadcast, that their lives will never be the same again because every one of us must gear ourselves up for the next move. And we know that the next level of walk is gonna bring us into the kingdom. We do not want to walk into the kingdom with any self gratification, any kind of pride. We want to walk as true sons of almighty God, our father. We pray for a close relationship of everybody who's listening, including female, that we will all learn how to walk as sons of God. Father, we are grateful that you are our daddy. You're not just God and Lord and master and king, but you are our father. Because you are our father, we rest in your bosom. We do not fear in the season. We are not worried or anxious in the season because we know, Father, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. You're not just walking beside us, around us, surrounding us, but you walk in us with all your glory and splendor. And in this time of preparation, I pray you will lead us by your spirit. I pray you will guide us through your word and teach us, Lord, the profound truths that it will take to redesign and to redefine the inner man until every image of Christ inside of us, every part of that image will be seen on the outside that will cause this earth to submit to you. And finally, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you. Thank you for Nishani. Thank you for Richard. Thank you for all those that are involved in this broadcast. I pray for them, Lord, even as they have such a zeal to broadcast the word of God, to help people understand the truth. I bless them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We, we are truly privileged. An absolute joy. Um, <laughs> thank you. And to all our Facebook Live uh, viewers and our Facebook family, thank you so much for joining us. I know that you've cleaned many, many nuggets. And as we close now and say goodbye, I just want to say, you know, may God bless you. May God make his face to shine upon you. And may hope always light your heart. Thank you. Bye-bye, Mom Roj. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, honey. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.